Welcome back to the FBC Extra Podcast. Today we are going to pepper our beloved pastor teacher, Tyler Scarlett, with the questions you asked anonymously over the last few months. So let the difficult questions begin. All right, we're here again with Pastor Tyler. Now, we were supposed to do Pepper the Pastor a few months ago, but life got busy for both of us, so I'm thankful that we finally get to grill you on some questions. Pastor, how you doing? Are you ready to get grilled? I'm doing well, Matt. I, <laughs> I feel like I owe you and the entire church and our <laughs> podcast audience, yeah, whatever yeah. that is, an apology. We had scheduled this much earlier. Mm-hmm. I had planned to answer these questions, but the Southern Baptist Convention, some vacation yeah. all got in the way, and I just I missed the timing on it, so my apologies. I know people were just waiting for yeah. this episode. Well, I'm of sure. course. They were chomping at the bit. <laughs> and as it turns out, I didn't know this, but being engaged in planning a wedding takes a lot of work. That's I right. didn't know that. That's right. So syncing up our schedules yeah. has been a challenge. Yeah, and all that. Right. So of course, we just finished up Lamentations mm-hmm. and right. we were in First John earlier this year. And I always like to start off before anything to ask you about the messages and the sermons because I'm always interested where you're at with it. Let's go back to the beginning of the year. Yeah. We're, we're starting in First John. What was your thought? on First John. Yeah, you know, I, I've read First John many times. I've never studied it to this extent, but wow, I was amazed at how practical it was mm-hmm. and how many people, you know, I've always talked to people that struggle with assurance, yeah. and that's the theme of John, but how many people who said, you know, I've never really struggled, but boy, this really solidified it for me. Yeah. This helped me to see some things that maybe I knew, but I hadn't really just seen spelled out. Yeah, so I thoroughly enjoyed First John. It ministered to me. It's easy to understand. Kids can understand it, so... Yeah. Yeah, first John was great. What really jumped out the page to me was the love for fellow believers. Yeah especially Forrest. And so I felt that was a huge theme that I never really thought about that come through the book. And then, of course, in the summer, we have the gut punch of Lamentations, (laughs) which was that on purpose with Daniel being last year? Because I know Daniel is there in exile. Right. And then we kind of jump back almost like a prequel movie to kind of before that. I don't know that I had put that much thought into it. Okay, okay. So, I mean, honestly, the thought process, I preached a minor prophet every year for 13 years. Yes, yes. Finish those. Mm -hmm. Daniel is kind of a minor minor profit in terms of length. Yeah. And I uh, just to be brutally honest, I'm not ready to bite off Isaiah and Ezekiel. Uh, how do you bite off I Ezekiel? I don't know. Those are huge <laughs> uh, intimidating books. Yeah, yeah. And so I was kind of looking at what was there in the prophets and I thought, "Oh, Lamentations, I haven't done that yet." And then Pastor Steve had planned to preach Jeremiah. Yeah, that worked out really well. We hadn't really planned it. We'd kind of penciled it in, then we're discussing and I went, "Oh, that'd be a great combination." So, yeah, yeah it seems like God's providence in pulling those two together. So, so. you have epistle and then an old text Testament poetry. Yeah. What is harder? Is is one necessarily harder than the other? Because I know people kind of either like the yeah. Old Testament stories or they like the, the epistles and yeah. they feel comfortable. But hands down, Old Testament poetry is a much more difficult animal. Okay. Um, it's not straightforward. Epistles tell you this, therefore this, therefore this. Mm-hmm. You just follow the argument, look at yeah. the verbs. It's simple. Old Testament poetry, there's all this like imagery and, and they don't tell you exactly. So you have to kind of guess at yeah. the application sometimes and some of the implications. So yeah. I mean, commentaries help a lot. but And also when you're preaching it, you don't want to flatten it out so it doesn't feel like poetry because we should let the text sort of feel like that. So it's a lot harder to try to paint pictures with your words, but I'm grateful that God's Word always challenges me as I'm preparing to preach it. I remember you talking about how every chapter has 22 verses except Mm -hmm. for chapter 3. Right. Is there anything else that you weren't able to go into during the messages that was interesting about the poetry itself? Because yeah. it felt like there was a lot kind of underneath the surface there. Absolutely there was. I think the one, I hinted at this in the introductory sermon, but I really wanted to flesh it out, is something in the poetry. It's really specific. It's called the meter or like the the rhythm. Mm-hmm. So it's based in syllables, and most of them are even. We think cat in the hat, right? Like, like the syllables kind of work together. But in this poetry, it's actually the rhythm is off. And so of being three three two two, it's three two three two three two. So it feels like you're limping yeah. through the book. Well, in chapter five, it returns to the more common pattern of two oh, okay. two two two. So it's almost like his grief healing a little bit by that last chapter. Oh wow! And he's starting to sort of come to terms with it. Mm-hmm. And so the, the book ends with this prayer, yeah. and it's almost like prayer is the answer that he needs at this point and thing. And so yeah, you can't see that, and I didn't want to just bore people to. 
to death with it. But the poetry of Lamentations is just incredible. Is it hard to read with that 3232? Three, two, three, two? Is that part of the point? Are you reading it in the original Hebrew as well? I am using some helps. Okay. My Hebrew is rusty. I'm okay. not, not going <laughs> to lie. And so I rely on commentaries for Hebrew. Uh-huh. But I can, you know, read through it, sound it out, look at the patterns and those things. But Hebrew poetry is not an accident. If it's there, it's there on purpose. For if there's Jewish people reading it, yeah. would it feel off to them? Yes, it would. Okay. Absolutely. And yes. so they would see in chapter five, oh, okay, now this this yeah. feels right. right. Well, that's interesting. Yep. Okay. And so now we head to First Samuel. Yeah, I think a lot of the stories are familiar, but sort of pulling them together and preaching it together. And I'm still working through some of the details with that. We're lining it up with the small groups for the church. Yeah. So we're going to start and kind of end right before Christmas, kind of when the small groups wrap up, mm-hmm. and then pick it back up after the break. And okay. so it, whether students are here or just the church people, you know, regular church body, we should be able to study it both on Sundays and in small groups. And That's terrific. Line up I was there. wondering if you were going to squeeze it all into 2022. I wasn't sure how that no, was going to work. Gonna do, we're going to do one chapter a week, and I think I'm going to do the whole book. So it's 31. One right at the breaking point. Okay. It's a very natural break in the book, and so we'll pick it back up and follow. Okay. Next. Do we know what we're going to call it? I'm still working on to, to be revealed. Okay. So I'm not going to give anything away. All right. Well, I'm going to stop asking my question and ask other people's questions. Great. The first one, the question that was asked is, was there anything culturally inappropriate about Ruth laying at Boaz's feet? So do you remember this story? Yes. Okay. The short answer is n- no. But for those that may not know or just listening to this, it's Ruth chapter 3. Of course, you have Ruth and Naomi, and you know she doesn't have a husband, and goes back to Bethlehem and meets Boaz. So in chapter 3, Naomi tells Ruth, you know, Boaz is our closest relative. They had this Old Testament law about leveret marriage. And so she tells her to go down to the threshing floor, and she says, wash yourself. This is chapter 3, verse 3. Anoint yourself, put on your best clothes go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known. And then she says, when he lies down, uncover his feet, lie down, and then he will tell you what you shall do. So it's interesting. I've heard it said before that Naomi may not be a good character in the story. Yeah, I think the question is, is that a last ditch effort on her part to just say, you know what, let's just go for this yeah. because I'm alone and there's this hint of bitterness. And it may, there may be a little bit of, she's implying that she should seduce him. You know, Mm -hmm. is some of this. And what's really fascinating in the text is Ruth does exactly what she says, but doesn't maybe do what she implies. So if she's implying something more, like throw yourself at this man, right? She does line by line what she says, but actually does it in a way that honors Boaz and honors God in the process. And so when she shows up, it says that in verse 7 that Boaz laid down and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and laid down. And he wakes up and asks, who are you? And they have this discussion. So it's interesting. It, It seems to me that what's happening here is cultural. Right. When she says to him, I am Ruth, your maid, spread your covering over your maid or spread your garment over me. That's clearly a symbol of asking him to embrace her, Uh, not physically embrace her, but like take her under his wing. It, It really is a case of her essentially proposing to him. Oh, wow. Yeah. It seems that she is saying to him, <laughs> if she was Beyonce, if you like it, put a ring. You yeah. Put a ring yeah, on yeah, it, yeah. Right? <laughs> like she, she's coming to him and saying, because back in chapter two, if you remember, he said when he met her, may God provide for you. And he actually says, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. The word wing and the word garment in Hebrew come from a similar root. So he says, may God cover you with his wings. And then she says, would you now cover me with your garment? And it's the same root. And it seems that she's saying, you are the answer to your prayer. Like you are praying that God would provide. And I think that you as my kinsman, redeemer, closest relative can actually be the answer to the prayer that you prayed for me. And Boaz, I think, is a man of integrity. So if people think, oh, there's something shady happening here, you know, sexually or whatever else, that's not the case. Because if you look at the next chapter, he goes out of his way to make sure that the closer relative has a shot. I mean, that he can fulfill the law. He's clearly doing this as a man of integrity, doing what's right by her. Okay. And uh, to read something inappropriate in this, I think, is really straining what the text is saying. Again, was it inappropriate? No. In the same way that today a woman proposing to a man is not 
a sin. Yeah. That's not wrong. It's unusual. So, yeah, it would be culturally unusual, I, I but not so. unacceptable. I think it would be okay. unusual. But, like, say if a man was going off to war or something and she wanted to make clear, yeah. like, hey, we yeah, need yeah. to get married. Right? Desperate times call for desperate measures. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so I do think that that may be some what's happening here. Again, not wrong, not sinful, unusual probably, but clearly it was in God's providence to bring it all together. And okay. obviously the story ends with the coming of Jesse and David and ultimately the coming of Christ. So yeah. Ruth is in that genealogy and yeah, this had to take place. So. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, for parents who have kids who will be involved in homosexual marriages, is it sinful and unbiblical for the parents to go to that wedding? Yeah, that's a very hard question, and I appreciate whoever wrote this and submitted this because I know this is not an easy one, but I think it's a very important one. Let's just go back for a moment to kind of set the context. Maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people would have said legalizing gay marriage, that's not going to happen, and here we are. And I think an argument can be made, what does 10 years from now hold? Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. we've seen the sort of erosion of the culture in some respects. So let's state the obvious. This is not slowing down these yeah. kinds of questions. And so I think we have to make sure we do think about them and that we're nuanced and careful in how we do that. So the question is about a parent attending a wedding, you know, yeah. for their son or daughter. So here's my larger question back. What is a person doing at a wedding? You're not just watching it. It's not like going to the movies and just seeing it. You're actually there to be a witness. In fact, most pastors say we are gathered here today to witness, right? Yeah. That's more than just to see something. And you're also there to celebrate the thing. In fact, most uh, marriage licenses, the pastor has to sign and two witnesses. I I'm endorsing this with my signature. Yeah. Right. So it's more than just like I saw it. Right. It happened, but I'm actually sort of putting my credentials uh, in that regard. So my point in saying that is you're there to witness and also to celebrate. Yeah. Right. This thing. So let me just, again, back up for a moment. Maybe there's other weddings we shouldn't be going to. Right. That's sort of normal in society. Mm -hmm. Right. But that we need to realize if you see a Christian who's marrying an unbeliever. So they got the sexuality part right. Right. They're both heterosexual. But that doesn't mean that's a good wedding. And that doesn't mean it's one that you should go to celebrate Mm -hmm. let alone witness and endorse in that way. In fact, we don't really do this anymore at weddings. I don't I do not do it. I don't know any pastor that does. But if you've ever seen old movies, some, the pastor will say, if anyone knows why this man shouldn't marry this woman. That's right, yeah. Right? Why are they doing that? Because marriage is not just a personal private thing. It has societal implications. There is a reason that the community knows. Like this yeah. woman's been married before and, you know, it wasn't known because she's from another state or, you know, there, there's lots of possibilities. Like there is a time for the community to say this shouldn't take place because that recognizes when you got children involved, when you got all kinds of things, there are marriages good for society and marriages that aren't good for society. And so I think being aware of that, it reminds us that marriage is a creation thing, not just a Christian thing. Mm -hmm. And so we have a duty to think in those categories that this is good or not good for society. So I want to be careful about binding people's conscience on this issue, but I think to attend a homosexual wedding in the way that I've defined it as something you're witnessing there to endorse and celebrate, I think that is implicitly supporting it. And pastorally, I, I would not encourage someone to participate and celebrate in that. Even in a parent-kid format. Yeah, so obviously that makes this extremely hard, and yeah. I, I understand that. And I don't want to ignore the emotional grief and the pain and the difficulty, but it, it is a reminder to us that following Jesus sometimes is hard. In Matthew 10, Jesus said that he will set son against father yeah. and set this family members against each other. And he says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Okay. So at the end of the day, I think we have to remind ourselves family isn't Lord. Sentimentality isn't Lord, but ultimately yeah. Jesus is Lord. And so I think in allegiance to him, we have to make sure that we're mindful of that. Now, having said that, I'll give one piece of sort of recommendation in this. So I think you obviously love your son or daughter. I think you can show, you know, sort of that paternal care for them. But the advice that I've, I've heard said before, and I think it's great advice. In that case, don't buy them a wedding gift but keep buying them a birthday gift. As in, you're drawing a line yeah. about this thing yeah, yeah. because God has said X, 
but I still love them. Yeah. I'm going to treat them with dignity. I'm going to show them that I care about them in a redemptive way. And I'm not just going to completely break off this relationship Yeah, because you want to be able to share the gospel with them and so on and so forth. So yeah, I would say my advice would be, I think it's certainly unwise. Can I say it's a sin? I certainly think it's something that I would discourage a Christian, even a parent, from participating in, yeah. in a way that would say, I'm endorsing, I'm supporting, I'm celebrating this, because we cannot call good evil and evil good. Mm-hmm. The Bible's quite clear on that. Yeah. And so I think that would be my pastoral advice on that. Okay. Next we have, what does the Bible have to say about dating? Most of the relationship advice I've found in the Bible is between husbands and wives or Christians in general. Does the Bible speak to dating? That's a great question, and the answer is yes and no. Simple answer, right? So I think it's important to remember the Bible was written in a certain context, Mm -hmm. right? Certain historic context. And in an age when marriages were, for the most part, arranged, right? See, in Genesis, we see it kind of all the way through. And so there was no dating in the way that we think of it as Western Americans, you know, right now. So the Bible was written in that culture. But here's the thing. The Bible is not necessarily prescribing that culture. So there are some Christians who read that and say, oh, well, marriages were arranged or as there was a betrothal period, then we have to do that today to be faithful. Well, there's a difference between what the Bible is describing and what it's prescribing. And I think it's describing the culture and the setting, you know, Middle Eastern culture, right? So Mm -hmm. we've got to recognize those are differences than today. And I think the beauty of the Bible is it works in all cultures. Yeah. So whether it's arranged marriages, like even today in India, there's places, there's betrothal, right? Like you think of this sort of, it's a combination of the two, or sort of westernized dating in that sense. I think it can give us guidance for all of those things. So I don't think we have to duplicate and everybody has to just court towards marriage in the very rigid kind of betrothal sense. So that being said, are there principles? Well, certainly there are. Scripture is is the, the rule of faith and practice, and our practice of relationships is grounded in what God's Word said. So I'm defining dating here then, so let's kind of maybe define our terms because I think that helps. It's an intentional relationship with someone of the opposite sex with an eye towards marriage. I think all those words matter in that definition. Mm -hmm. So I think it's you're being intentional, right? Like you can be friends with anybody at any point, right? But we're saying, no, we're going to kind of like pair off to some degree. We're going to explore this. We're going to look at compatibility and some of those things. I think that's a healthy, you know, wise thing to do. But saying like we're not going to get too wrapped up because we want to see if this is going towards marriage, if this is the kind of thing that would honor God. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if by dating you mean hookup culture, right? The yeah, it's probably yeah, bad. The Bible's <laughs> clearly against that. Yeah, um, yeah. But if you're saying, no, like it's an intentional friendship and we're going to try to move towards this relationship and to see if it can move towards commitment, then I think the Bible helps us. So a couple of specific things come to mind. Second Corinthians six fourteen: do not be unequally yoked. Mm-hmm. So what do we learn from that? Don't date someone you wouldn't marry. Like yeah. it's just a waste of time. Like why, yeah. <laughs> why even do that? Yeah. Right? There's probably some bad motive underneath the surface if yeah, that's yeah. what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So I certainly think that. I also think look at the spiritual compatibility of the couple. And it may take family and friends, church members helping you see that because you don't always see it yourself. Yeah. It's not always like, a well, she's Pentecostal and he's Baptist, so they shouldn't get together. Well, that may not be the case. But if she feels called to inner city ministry, you know, and he wants to go to Myanmar and there's this big gap between yeah. How they're yeah, yeah. trying to serve God, there might not be good spiritual compatibility between yeah. the two, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think you want to look at some of those things. Do you work, you know, serve similar? I think being in the same church or similar church can help to kind of work some of that out, which is good. And then First Timothy chapter five, maybe the most specific advice Paul writes uh, to treat younger women as sisters with all purity. So. Paul clearly has a sense that there's going to be a relationship between men and women in the church, yeah. in the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so he says, here's here's God's line in terms of like, if you want to think physical, you know, the physical relationship, those kinds of things, it should be done in purity as if she's your sister. In fact, what's funny, I was talking about this with one of the staff members and I said, like Christianity is the only religion where your sister becomes your wife. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? And it clearly yeah, spiritual, yeah, 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 spiritual yeah, yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. But that really <laughs> is the case. If you honor her as a co-heir of Christ, right, mm-hmm. of the grace of Christ, yeah. and you love her that way and care for her as a sister in Christ in a way that's pure and honors God, then the day you say I do, you can do it with a good, clean conscience, you know, yeah. before God and uh, everyone else. And so, yeah, I think there's other things we can add in terms of wisdom and looking at, you know, sort of 
family background, some of those things. But I will say this, and this is purely anecdotal in my own gut. When it comes to dating and engagement, I think couples date and are engaged for too long. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I see too many problems that comes oftentimes with it. And because I do think it it should lead towards marriage, like that's what God established, then I think we need to be intentional about it and do that because there's so much you just have to learn by being married. Like the idea I'm going to kick the tires and test drive this person is really using them. Some of the dating culture is unhelpful that way and and really denigrating to the person. Whereas to make a commitment and say, no, I'm going to love you regardless of what happens. Yeah. And my, my vow is to you. I think that honors Christ. That honors the idea of covenant. And so I think that's actually the way to, to work moving forward. So yeah, that's some of the ideas that I think come to mind. Okay. Now the next one's a little bit more personal for you. Do you ever feel bad for putting your kids through the pastor's kid lifestyle? I want to know who wrote that question. <laughs> <laughs> it clearly is a pastor's kid, yeah, I suspect. It's, because... And there's six of them, so you can take your pick on which one it is. <laughs> oh, my. I am actually fascinated to know yeah. your answer on this. I yeah. actually am. Okay. Uh, do I feel bad about putting the... Okay. So let me do this. All right. Let me turn the tables on this question. Okay. I'm not going to answer this as a pastor. Mm-hmm. I'm going to answer this as a pastor's kid. Okay. Yeah, that's true. I was a pastor's true. kid my yeah. entire life. Does it come with some unique challenges and responsibilities? Yes. I mean, let's remember Titus 1, your children are actually part of your qualifications. Yeah. Right? Like, mm-hmm. that's that's part of it. My family is part of that. So that's my first flock, my first responsibility. If a man can't manage his own household, how can he manage the household of God? Mm-hmm. You know, the Bible says. So it's not that my kids have to be perfect, and I think that's some of the misunderstanding there. But I, I do think that being a pastor's kid, it comes with some, some of those sort of responsibilities in some ways, mm-hmm. but it comes with some great privileges. Yes, absolutely. I mean, some tremendous privileges in terms of the people you meet and the things you get to do and be exposed to and watch God work. Answers to prayer. I mean, our family is praying probably for a bigger circle than what most church members, like you pray for your small group, your Sunday school class. Yeah. But as a pastor, I'm, I'm trying to think of the entire church and we're praying for them. And so we're, we're, our kids are seeing answered prayer yeah. a lot more regularly, you know, and maybe than s- some others do in some respects. Obviously, the church is filled with so many kind of spiritual uncles or parents. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah. and I, so I just, I loved being around that. I think it benefited me despite what some people think. And I'm, I'm citing a survey here. I can't remember which one. Less than 10% of pastor's kids abandoned the faith. Less than 10%. That's reassuring because there is kind of that stigma. Of... Some people think, oh, you're going to turn them off. And now that doesn't mean they're all like in ministry themselves or something like that. Yeah. But 90% of them will remain in the faith or continue in it. And um, I think that speaks well for what it's like to be raised as a pastor kid. There's obviously, you know, some bad situations and things. You know, I always enjoyed it. I thought it was great. You know, who else gets to play in the baptistry? When you're little. That's true. I mean, we splashed around in the baptistry. Uh, <laughs> who else gets the leftovers after the church meal? Oh, yeah. That's a big one. I mean, that's we, a seriously, huge plus. Uh, people are constantly yeah. bringing us stuff. You know what's funny? I, I'll tell you this real quick story. Where we grew up in Tennessee and Alabama, it was more rural, yeah, you know, yeah. kind of country. And there was a practice. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Many people probably haven't even heard of it. It's called a pounding. No. So when a new pastor comes to the church, the church would have a pounding. Basically, everybody in the church bought a pound of something. I thought they were like punching you yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like it. No, not a beating, <laughs> but they'd bring a pound of sugar, a pound of flour, a pound of, you know, different things. Really? Beans, whatever else. And so <laughs> they would help stock our fridge and stuff when we first moved Oh, that's moved so cool. In. And so to be part, that happened at least twice that I remember as a kid. And just to see these people, I don't know yet, but to love yeah. us and to welcome us us and like to actually give of what they have yeah. very new testament idea sharing what they have yeah i thought that was always a very special thing to watch and see and so my kids will have different experiences not exactly the same thing but i generally think being a pastor's kid has more perks and privileges yeah. than it does sort of downsides was there an expectation to go into ministry do you think as a pastor's kid for both you being a pastor's kid and your kids being pastor's kids not from my parents okay my parents made it abundantly clear you can do whatever you want to do, mm-hmm. just glorify God. Yeah. Now, when I said I feel like God's calling me to ministry, they were thrilled. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they enjoyed that, but I never felt like I was pressured to do it. In fact, they know. The only thing worse is somebody doing it that shouldn't be doing it. And with my own kids, I've told the same thing. You can be a plumber. You can do whatever you desire to do that God wants you to do. Don't go into ministry unless God actually calls you to do it. And now, again, do other people feel that way? I get that question a lot. Which one of your kids do you see might have 
you know, the calling or might this, I, I just say, eh, you know, it's all in yeah. God's timing. So we'll see. Yeah. Now this next one is interesting. Recently, you said something convicting about loving other Christians and gave the example of a communist Christian in China. It's hard to think of communism as compatible with Christian beliefs, but it's a good challenge to think over which differences are the ones we should be concerned about. What are some differences that would be worth debating and which are worth ignoring and how to determine that? Yeah. So that's a great question. I would point this person and, and everyone listening to an insert I wrote in the bulletin that's also on the church website you can mm-hmm. access. It was called a theological triage. You know, triage in hospitals, the, the more urgent patients get seen, it's not just, you know, that you get seen in order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you come in saying, I got I'm having a heart attack, they're going to take you right back. Right. Okay. Al Mohler popularized that phrase, and I think it's very helpful when you think of doctrine, we should think in terms of triage. Usually it's kind of a triangle. If you think it broken into thirds, there's a one, a two, and a three. So mm-hmm. first tier, second tier, third tier. And we get that idea in part from the Bible itself. First Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul says that here is the gospel, and he says which was of first importance. Right. He uses this phrase, it is of first importance. Um, which means he's ranking it higher than other things he's talked about in the book of 1 Corinthians, mm-hmm. where he talks about head coverings and tongues and gifts. He says, if you get this wrong, right, the, the death and resurrection of Christ, yeah. really the rest of that doesn't matter. Right. So I think making sure that we think in terms of what's of first importance, right? So that first tier is what makes me a Christian or, or not a Christian. Right. Right. So what are those fundamental things? Like the, the nature of God— Right. Yeah. The Trinity, the Bible is God's word, the atonement of Christ, the resurrection, those kinds of issues. I think you're either a Christian or you're not. Right. You deny them. You're outside the faith. So it makes me clear I'm a Christian and I'm not a Mormon. Right. right. I'm a Christian and not a, a humanist or whatever it might be. I think those issues were, are where we do draw clear lines. Right. And would even sort of, you know, debate, battle, you know, do apologetics, those kinds of things to say, here's why Christianity is believable and good and right and all those kinds of things. And so I think we mark that there and that we recognize there's people I'm going to disagree with, but I agree with on this. Yeah. Right. So my Presbyterian friends, my Lutheran friends, we agree on Christ. We agree on the gospel. We agree on the Bible. We put that in place. And then we work down to the second tier, which basically distinguishes who I go to church with. So within Christianity, there's not just one denomination. There's, you know, many churches that gather. And so we recognize, hey, we might do baptism different. We might believe spiritual gifts different. They're you know, different things. We're all Christians, yeah. right? But we're going to draw some lines for kind of practical purposes in some respects, but also some out kind of some theological conviction about what that means. And then that third tier are those issues that I can disagree with people in my Sunday school class. Gotcha. Right. So things like the end times, unless a church uh, takes a position on it, it's one of those things where we can say in terms of how much gopher bark was used in the wood, you know, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ark, what, I don't know. I mean, there's any number of things we could talk about that some people might speculate, they might have ideas, but it's certainly not reason to start a new denomination. Right. Or to break over. In fact, there are things that we might even regularly change our minds on. So like the cultural appropriation of Ruth's actions in Ruth 3 well, there you would go. be a tertiary one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So. So. Okay. So, you know, Christians can disagree sometimes on a certain aspects of politics, like mm-hmm. this particular policy, right? Yeah. You can have two Jesus-loving, Bible-believing Christians mm-hmm. who see this policy because of its advantages or disadvantages from a different perspective. And I think we've got to leave room to agree to disagree on some of those things as well. So you can agree to disagree over the third tier stuff. Um, you can draw some lines on the second tier stuff. And I think you can reject someone on the first tier stuff, as as scripture says, mark out these troublemakers who are not teaching the truth and, you know, do that. So, yeah, I I think that has always helped me to think in terms of, like, where do I sort of defend? Where do I bristle when I'm talking to this person? And where do I just go, okay, well, we see that differently. And uh, we can have an honest, loving discussion, even a debate. I think that's okay. But I don't think everything is to the level of first tier. If you think in that triangle sense, if you think of the two extremes, what's sometimes called liberalism, and the other extreme would be fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. Liberalism says everything is third tier. The resurrection of Jesus, ah, that's not a big deal. Gotcha. Like, you don't have to believe in that. Mm-hmm. The Bible, okay, you can say it's God's word or not, right? So they kind of push everything down to that third one, 
Mm -hmm. right? And so a, there's no lines in some respect. Fundamentalism pushes everything in the first tier. Oh, okay, gotcha. So it says, if you don't agree on the end times and the particular seventh bowl <laughs> is, is this particular <laughs> yeah. weapon, you know, yeah. or whatever, yeah. <laughs> like they, they will draw really rigid lines on things the Bible's not so rigid on. Right. Right. And so I think there's a ditch on both sides of the road. Yeah. And we want to avoid that and kind of see, okay, like, but let's be sensible at where does the Bible put the most emphasis? Let's put that up top. Right. Right. And what are the things that, that we can then disagree with and work on together? So. Well, I, I think this will be a uh, third tier question then, which mm -hmm. is our next one. Yep. In in between his death and resurrection, where did Jesus go? <laughs> I think that's third tier, correct? I, I That's probably, yeah, a little further <laughs> down the list. No, yeah. for sure. um, so between his death and resurrection, where did Jesus go? Okay, well, we know where his body was, mm -hmm. but I think they're talking about his, if you want to use soul, spirit, yes. yeah. right? Okay, the intangible. My short answer is I don't know. Uh, I said this in a sermon a few weeks ago, Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine. the secret things belong to the Lord. Yeah, yeah, God. yeah. All right, but I do have a hunch and I do think the Bible does hint at some things. It's, again, this is not a position I would die for. Of course. Okay? Yeah. So let me ask this question. Why why three days? Why didn't Jesus just die on Friday and then rise a couple hours later? Well, doesn't three have some morning? symbolism? Well, it does have some symbolism, but there's also, it seems to be, there's something happening during that time period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That's taking place. I think a compelling case can be made that Jesus descended to the dead. Some of the creeds use the word hell. I'm less comfortable with that because of what we think that means. But to use the scriptural language of Sheol or the grave, mm -hmm. right? Clearly that's the case. In Acts chapter 2, uh, let me just read a verse. I think this is maybe one of the clearest statements about it. Acts 231. Peter's preaching. This is Pentecost. He says, he's speaking here of David writing in the Old Testament. David looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ that he that is, Christ, was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see decay. But this Jesus God raised up again. He makes this distinction of where his flesh was in the ground where it could suffer decay, and that he was not abandoned to Hades or to the place of the dead. And 1 Peter chapter 2 similarly talks about Jesus declaring to the captives, right? yeah. it speaks of after his, his death, declaring to the captives something that's demons, forces of evil, that he's declaring him. So the way I've heard it explained, which I think is helpful, we think of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and then we think about the ascension of Jesus, right? Yeah. him going to heaven. But if this is the case, the ascension, the ascending of Jesus begins with the descending of Jesus. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So he's he's dead, and through his death, he then goes to the captives, and again, let's let's say spiritual forces, and declares the victory is mine. Right. He's actually yeah. making known that he has died for the sins of the world, and he's declaring to them his superiority. And so the exaltation, as we we speak of Christ, actually begins with him going lower in, yeah. in some respects, so that he is Lord not only of heaven and earth. But under the earth, right? So <laughs> Philippians talks about yeah. everyone will confess on earth, above the earth, and under the earth, right? Mm -hmm. They've all now seen and heard. So any spiritual forces, it, this could be the, the soul of, of those that are unbelievers, you know, from the Old Testament, but they've all heard and seen, right? This is not about a second post-mortem evangelism, you know, in order to be saved. The Bible's clear about that, I believe. But it's declaring his victory yeah. to those over the earth, on the earth, and even under the earth yeah. uh, as well. Again, if you put a gun to my head, I could change my mind real quick <laughs> yeah, about yeah. that. I, I think that the Bible seems to hint in a few places, but that's exactly what you said earlier. Clearly, this isn't clear, or it would be first tier and, yeah. and repeated. Mm -hmm. You know, the bodily resurrection of Christ, right? There's no doubt about that, and we, we draw real sharp, hard lines there. So We have the important stuff. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. As Alistair Begg beautifully puts it, the main things are the plain things, and yeah. the plain things are the main things. Yeah. And so I think this is one of those, it's fun to discuss and yeah. debate. By the way, there's a great book about this that was recently written by oh, a nice. guy named Matt Emerson. I think it's entitled, He Descended to the Dead, and it's, it's an evangelical perspective on what's called Holy Saturday. So mm -hmm. where did Jesus go between Friday and Sunday? 
And he basically defends this view and does, I think, a, a really good job. Yeah. At. And he does obtain the keys to death and hell correct. during that time as well. That's correct. So yeah. all of that goes together and okay. he makes that quite clear. So Now, our last one we have is one that is kind of close to my heart because I, I also am in this current situation. Yeah. Someone asks, how do I witness to coworkers and friends who profess to be Christians but have some basic things wrong about Jesus? Oh, that's a wonderful question. First of all, let me just say I really appreciate how that question is worded because it shows really good discernment by whoever this church member is um, because they're wise enough to realize that not everybody who claims to be a Christian necessarily is, mm -hmm. okay? Again, if we kind of bring several of these questions together, a person can have differing views about, say, baptism or spiritual gifts or, you know, where did Jesus go when he died? But when it comes to who Jesus is, yeah. right, what the gospel is, if they've got things wrong about him, then I think we really have to deal with that for what it is. People were listening during First John. Well, you and, can and take that's, surety that, of that. That's, that's great, and that's exactly <laughs> what it is. Because yeah, yeah. First John says there's a lot of people who like Jesus mm -hmm. that don't follow Jesus. Right. A lot of people who admire him that don't submit to him. And so how do you know that a person is a Christian? Is that they obey his commands? So I think the question is, and again, I don't have the person here to ask. They say they have some basic things wrong about Jesus. Are they wrong, like willfully wrong or just ignorantly wrong? Are they maybe in a church that just doesn't teach very well? And so they really love what they know of Jesus in that yeah. sense. Well, that person may just need discipleship. If you remember in the New Testament, when Paul goes out, uh, he finds a group of people and he says, have you heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they said, no, <laughs> but we know about Jesus and we know about the baptism of John. And so like he explains to them more. So he recognized the fact these these people really are trying, you know, in that sense. And so he comes at them to kind of cause of their humility and says, hey, let me teach you and show you what's right and what's yeah. good. So the best way to combat error is always with the truth. And so, again, whether they're just ignorant, need to be discipled, that, that's one approach. Open a Bible together and talk about it. I mean, that's the best advice I can give. Plan a, you know, lunch time if, if it comes up in time. Hey, let's get it together and let's just read part of this gospel or, uh, you know, look at a particular epistle and let's look at some of those things and see where maybe some of their questions or, you know, issues are. If it's on the other side and they're wrong because, well, they're in a, a non-Christian church or, you know, they're they're part of some, you know, I mean, there's there are cults even in our own region here. They believe things about Jesus that are wrong because that's their doctrine. Well, that's a different sort of issue. And I think the Bible's clear that we should oppose those people, we should appeal to them, we should share the truth with them, but realize that's a little different than somebody who's, you know, needing to grow in those things. So I think the best way to do this is to use Scripture. The Bible is what changes people, it makes a difference. And th that doesn't always mean, Matt, that doesn't always mean opening a Bible and reading chapter and verse. Sometimes it may just be quoting Scripture as you're talking. Like, yeah. they don't even necessarily know it's a Bible verse. Yeah, yeah. But say, oh, you said this about Jesus, you know, what do you think about this? And, yeah. and, and quote a, a verse. Mm -hmm. What well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes. What do we think about that, right? Yeah, yeah. And see what kind of response you get because the word is what does the work uh, in people's lives. So find out what they believe. Challenge them with scripture. And again, if it's a discipleship issue, then help them to grow in that. Yeah. Um, if it's uh, they're obstinate and just, you know, unbelieving in these, you know, or believing what's not true. I mean, I think the Bible's quite clear that, you know, again, you can debate with them and challenge them with God's word, but you don't give what is holy to dogs. There yeah, comes yeah. a point you just don't waste your time and you seek to disciple those who, who need it. So I, I think one other practical piece of advice, if you don't even know where to go with the person, yeah. here's what I would say. Invite them to church, listen next to them about the sermon, and then afterwards say, so what did you what did you hear? Yeah. Like, what, did, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Does your t church talk about Jesus like that? And so kind of dialogue them that way. So it's not you coming at them, but you're picking apart me or somebody else's sermon. Yeah, but yeah. then it gives you something to talk about. And I think that can be a great practical way yeah. to do it. Now I'm going to transition to my questions. Okay. The first one actually comes from the word of the pastor because school's starting. Uh -huh. You had some advice for students in your word from the pastor. Yeah. There are a couple of them that struck me as different like a lot of them you know like eat make sure you eat breakfast and pay attention in class and don't skip your class i, I saw That's that right. one yep. i wanted to ask you about a couple of them right. that i just thought were slightly interesting give your humanities classes your undivided attention yeah, yeah. i've never heard anybody say anything like that about yeah. like incoming freshmen and stuff yeah so culture matters art matters mm -hmm. history matters this stuff is not 
uh, secondary to what it means to be a Christian. In fact, the greatest Christians in history have expressed their faith through science and art and, and literature and those kinds of things. You've already seen TikTok. It's true. Right? You've already it's seen true. YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, think about some of the deep, rich things that, that make up our culture and history and heritage. I think it helps us as a nation, right? I think it's the co- part of the common good that yeah. we all think along these things and aren't just sort of reactionary to how we feel about stuff, but we stop and think yeah. about it. Now, on another one that's interesting, and I'm just curious uh, what your reasoning is, is uh, consider board games over video games. Yeah. You're swimming upstream on that one more and more, I'm realizing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> My own children did yeah, 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 yeah. That, I think. So I, I guess what I really meant by that is board games foster interaction with people, mm-hmm. like relationships. Now, certainly some video games do, if, yeah. you, if you stream that kind of thing, and people can do that. But there's still something tangible about being in the same room as a person. Yeah, And agreed. somebody, you know, laughing, pushing away from the table, giving each other a hard time. Yeah, yeah. That you don't get even through exactly, head, a yeah. headset. And so yeah, yeah. I think it's very human, very relatable, very relational. I just think it, it fosters that more than just sitting in front of a screen all day What long. board game is at the Scarlet household most often? What well, are you guys playing? We play a lot of board games. Oh, actually. really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We play a lot of games, especially when COVID happened. We oh, practically yeah. play the game every single day. <laughs> What's the one uh, tra- uh, trains? I get the, the oh, name uh, Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride, that's it. Okay. Uh, We we, we enjoy playing that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we have all the additions, and so we can play a short game, we can play a long game, so yeah, we enjoy it. Uh, The last one here, uh, meet with your professors outside of... I I never did that, so I'm curious, like, (laughs) what do do you think that actually... I even met a student today after class, and uh, we got to talk, and and I was really fascinated by how he got to Liberty. He's not from the U.S., and and his interests in preaching, and like some of the things that... What that means for his culture and his context. He's talking about street preaching where he's from as oh, cool. being a major, you know, like thing. Yeah. And I said, yeah, that's, that's like hardly happens here in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, except yeah. in a, like a protest or something like that. And it was really interesting for me to reflect on preaching yeah. with his culture and context in mind. So yeah. I just think we're better off. I think it shows you they're more than a talking head. Mm, yeah. You can encounter their humanity. You can hopefully, especially you know, with Liberty, your professors will pray with you. And yeah. hopefully you can get to see some of their heart, you know, mm-hmm. and hear some of those things. Some of my most memorable interactions with professors happened outside of the classroom. Yeah. Just talking to them, sharing my heart, sharing my struggles, sharing my joys, and to see them genuinely be excited for me. I just loved it. And I yeah. think sometimes students forget about the human side side of what education yeah for sure so uh last time it was what bible event would you want to see okay this time around being engaged myself and you know trying to glean as much as i can from other couples especially for you guys as a staff i'm going to start asking you guys uh how you met your spouses yeah Uh, so for you and rebecca we obviously all know you met at chick-fil-a but what exactly went into that i'll tell you the specific story Um, all right i i worked at chick-fil-a in alabama Okay. In high school, and I came here and needed a job, so I got the job here. She had worked at this one in high school as well. So Wards but, Road, right? Uh, no, Wards Road didn't exist. It was at the mall. Oh, okay. Yeah, this okay. is way back when. Wow. Okay. And um, <laughs> so she went to William & Mary, so she That's was right. gone. Tribe. Right, and so she came home for the summer to work. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know her, you know. And so here's here's the story. I worked there with my brother. That's right. He owns a Chick-fil-A now in Ohio, right? Well, no, that's my brother-in-law. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's but, right. but yes, so it runs deep in the family. <laughs> but my brother and I worked there. And Rebecca and her sister worked there. No way. So it was two sibling pairs, and people kind of knew that. And they had, when I first worked, they said, oh, there's this set of sisters that work here, blah, blah, blah. So the actual story is Rebecca's sister brought her in to introduce her to my brother. (laughs) She's like, oh, "Oh, there's this guy. You're going to like him. Y'all are going to hit it off. And she brought her in to meet him. Yeah, yeah. And they talked for a minute. And then she goes, oh, and that's his brother, Tyler. And I was like, hey. And I just kind of walked past. (laughs) Well, within a week, we had a shift together, and we were, you know, making chicken, working back there, and we just talked. And I just shared who I was and what what I was doing, and she did too. And I'm not making this up. There are witnesses to this story. She went home and told her mother, I met the man I'm going to marry. Wow. Based on one conversation. Based on one conversation. What did you say? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) You got to harness that. The the Liberty kids are going to want to know what you said. Sell that power. Yeah. I mean, I just told her God's called me to be a pastor. I'm here studying. And I mean, we just talked about different just things with life. And I wasn't even thinking about her that way. I was just like, oh, this girl I'm working with. But yeah, something in that 
like she just knew early on. And so did she have to tell you that or did you eventually no, she catch had on to too? tell me? Oh, okay. so I'm, I'm, I was very naive. <laughs> okay. I was singularly focused on yeah. I'm just doing school, going to be a pastor. You know? well, that's good. And it was actually my brother who he's like, you know, that girl likes you. Right. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he's like, she brings you brownies. And I'm like, yeah, they're good. And he's just like, no, there's more to this. And so we kind of dated long yeah, distance yeah. and then oh, okay. she went back to school mm -hmm. and I was in school. So, I mean, Back in those days, we literally wrote letters, some emails, phone calls, and I'd go see her occasionally. And yeah, so we dated that way. And uh, so that's... How long did you date? We dated, boy, that's a really tough, probably about two years between, okay. you know, we were trying to get close to finishing school. She's a She was a, a year ahead of me. Okay. So she graduated and got a job mm -hmm. teaching. And then I was in my senior year when we got married. Gotcha. So... It was about two years, but it was, again, two years long distance. So yeah. we were rarely, we were only together a few months during the summer times or gotcha. breaks when we did that. But yes, that is the full story. That's she, awesome. They were trying to hook her up with my brother and uh, everything. Wow. Everything changed. That's so funny. <laughs> and last but not least, I wanted to ask if you could have any biblical artifact for your office. And you have a pretty sweet office. If wow. you could have one biblical artifact when people walk in and it's like, oh, by the way, did you know I've got this on the, what would you choose? Well, it seems like the overachiever answer would be the Ark of the Covenant. Yes. Because that's got other yes, stuff in it. Yes, that's right. You that's right. The Ten Commandments and, you know, Aaron's staff and so forth. But if even if you couldn't do that, who wouldn't like to see the Ten Commandments? Yes. Right? Like the finger of God writing on stone. And like who, who wouldn't like to see? The broken version or the still intact I, version? Either one. Okay. I, I'll, I'll take either one <laughs> okay. of those. That would be cool, to, yeah, yeah, cool yeah. to have. But Cool. Yeah, I mean, I just, boy, it's, it's really interesting. I'm actually, though, super thankful God didn't let us have that stuff. Yeah. Because people would worship it. Christianity is about worshiping a risen Savior and not things and stuff. Yeah. Well, where would and, we um, put it, too? Like, where, yeah. where, where would the Ten Commandments end up, exactly. you know, in some of Museum. Right. And I, I, there are certain things, and this is my own gut, there are certain things I don't think God's going to let us find. So you don't think the Ark of Covenant's even here? Do you, it's not like buried somewhere? I have no opinion <laughs> okay, okay. on the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> okay. And, uh, Indiana yeah, Jones yeah. is the last thing. <laughs> in terms of its current existence, I really don't okay, know. Okay, gotcha. Don't know, so. Okay, the Ten Commandments. That's a good one. I, I That's a good one. Have, Very yeah. cool. Tyler, thank you so much for talking with us and answering some pretty tough questions, but we yeah, appreciate you my, putting in the work. My thanks to you, Matt, and my yeah. thanks to the church that took the time, the church members, to write yeah. the questions, and I certainly look forward to doing this again sometime. Of course. Yeah, we'll talk to you at the end of the year, and we're thankful for the work you've put in on First John and Lamentations. I especially love Lamentations, too. If you didn't listen to Lamentations, Lamentations too. We're very excited for First Samuel and the title to be determined That's right. on Sunday. That's so, right. But thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, man. <laughs> if you want to hear any of Pastor Tyler's sermons, you can listen on our podcast channel, YouTube, or the website at forestbaptistchurch.org. This Sunday begins our study in First Samuel. We'll see you there.